Hello everyone. Welcome back to Analog Snippets. A reliable chip startup is crucially important for any chip and ensuring that the values of all the available supplies are within the specified limit is an important aspect of a reliable chip startup. A supply which is little too low or little too high can result in functional or performance failures. And for that reason, power on reset and supply monitors are important part of any chip. In this video, I intend to talk about the design considerations of POR subsystem. Designs of this circuit may seem simple or rather unglamorous. But make no mistake, a lot of chips fail because of the faulty POR subsystem. So let's begin by trying to understand the design requirements of a POR. All supply monitors require a reliable reference voltage. And the most common way to generate this reliable reference voltage is bandgap circuit. And all bandgap circuits require a reliable supply voltage to work properly. So essentially, primary job of any POR circuit is to guarantee this minimum supply voltage. So if supply voltage is smaller than this minimum supply voltage, then POR outputs a zero. Now, by definition, POR is the first circuit which gives any meaningful output when supply ramps up. So it doesn't have reliable reference voltages or bias current available to it. And for that reason, PORs often have a crude circuitry which has large tolerances. Let's now look at some of the ways to implement the POR circuit. POR are usually voltage or current comparator which compare to supply dependence voltages or currents. When the supply is ramped up from the zero volt, there is an intermediate voltage where one voltage input takes over the other. And this crossover point is POR threshold. In the simplest implementation, one voltage is linearly dependent on the supply voltage. For example, a simple register divider. The other input will be a non-linear function of supply voltage. In the beginning, this non-linear input is higher than the linear input. But rate of increase of non-linear input slows down as supply increases. So let's build a simple circuit which can do that. So here we have the voltage comparator and our linear input, which is a voltage divider. Now, we know diode is a nonlinear component. So we can use diode to build our second input. Let's now plot our two input voltages as supply increases from zero volt. In blue, we have the input supply and in black, we have the output of the register divider. At low supply voltages, diode will be off. So this register here will pull the VD to the supply. But as supply keeps increasing, diode will start to conduct current. And VD will settle around diode turn on voltage. And as supply keeps on increasing at certain voltage, VR will take over VD. And at that supply, POR output will toggle from 0 to 1. So it is a very simple and neat way to design a POR circuit. We can easily tune the POR threshold using this register divider. Most of the practical implementation use a diode connected NMOS in the place of diode. Now let's consider the variation in POR threshold voltage. First of all, diode voltage or for that matter, threshold voltage of NMOS is highly temperature dependent parameter. As temperature increases, both these voltages reduce. On the top of it, threshold voltage of NMOS has its own process variations. Other sources of variation could be comparator offset and to some extent variation of R3. Including everything you can easily expect plus minus 20% variation to plus minus 40% variation in POR threshold. Fortunately, minimum supply voltage of a band gap also reduces with the temperature. So some of the variation cancels out. Let's now talk about the design of this comparator. First of all, this comparator should be able to generate its own bias. A commonly used technique is to use a register in place of current bias. A register being a passive element generates current even if there is a very small voltage difference across it. Now this comparator is supplied by the input supply itself. So at low supply values, this comparator may not be operational at all. So there should be a way to generate a very reliable output even at very low supplies. Registers again come to the rescue here. In this circuit, this register at the output ensures that output is a good ground when there is no bias current in the comparator. Now this register doesn't need to be at this place. 
Some designs use further gain stages after second stage to boost the gain. Those gain stages can again mess up the POR output. Make sure to put some register at the final stage. A final design consideration in this comparator is hysteresis. As a general rule, all comparator must have some hysteresis. You may put a Schmidt trigger as one of the gain stages or you may put other schemes. One scheme will be discussed later in the video. Now, this type of POR are easy to design and they are reliable. But there are two primary issues. The first concern is, as discussed before, the variation is rather large. This large variation is still acceptable if your supply voltage is high. For example, if your nominal supply voltage is higher than 2.5 volt, this scheme is still fine. But for lower supply voltages, for example 1.8 volt, variation can be unacceptable. The second problem is that threshold voltage is unrelated to band gap. Minimum supply voltage of band gap can have large variations itself. So it would have been nice if somehow POR can track this variation. To address both these issues, we can use band gap itself to generate the POR voltage. And this is what we will discuss next. We need to devise a way to sense that band gap is up and running. We can either sense a voltage or a current. A simple implementation which uses band gap current to build a POR can look like this. In this circuit, the right hand side branch is the same as the one used in the previous implementation. On the left, we have a band gap reference generator and a current comparator. PMOS MP senses the current in band gap circuit. Note that the gate of MP is not the reference voltage output of the band gap. Rather, it senses the current in the band gap. Now, right hand side branch is always on branch. So it will have some current even at very low supply voltages. On the other hand, band gap will have current only when it is turned on. So at low supply voltages, current in N2 will be higher than current in MP. Hence, the output will be pulled low. When band gap turns on, current in MP exceeds current in N2. And POR output becomes high. All the points discussed for the comparator in the previous section should be applicable here as well. And we need to keep appropriate margin to avoid any incorrect operation. For example, for a Banba reference generator, this current is fairly stable. But the current in the right branch will keep increasing with the supply voltage. So we need to make sure that including all the variation, this current never exceeds band gap current once the POR is triggered. You can similarly devise a POR circuit using reference voltage of band gap circuit and a voltage comparator. A note about the inverter which immediately follows this current comparator. A supply ramp is a comparatively slow signal. A supply ramp happens in several milliseconds. Also, a band gap startup can be a relatively slow process. As a result, this comparator output can have a very slow rise time. And that means this voltage can spend a long time in intermediate voltage values. But a typical digital inverter is designed for either a zero or a one input signal. A slowly ramping input signal can result in a large crowbar current through this inverter. So design this inverter to have a small crowbar current. Also check that there is no EM or electro migration violation in the metal of this inverter. And that is because a typical digital inverter is not designed to sustain a large current for large durations. Okay, now let's move to voltage monitors. There are typically two types of voltage monitors for supplies. The so-called UV LO or under voltage lockout. They are also known as under voltage detector or brownout detectors. These circuits indicate that the supply voltage is above the minimum specified voltage. Second type of detectors are over voltage detectors. And as name indicates, these detectors tell that supply is above their specifications. Under voltage detectors guarantee the performance of analog or digital circuits. While over voltage detectors ensure that there are no reliability concerns. Both type of detectors use the same circuit architectures. I think the most interesting aspect is how do we decide the UV LO thresholds. For example, let's assume following specifications for analog and digital supplies. These supply ranges are important because, for example, analog designers guarantee their performance for this supply range. And digital guys do their static timing analysis or STA for these supply corners. Now, ideally, we would like to be very precise around these limits. But consider following two aspects. 
First, even if you trim your detectors, there will be a tolerance to which they will be accurate. There can be various sources of error, for example, error in the trimming process or drift of the reference voltage itself. For our example, let's assume an error tolerance of plus minus 10 millivolts. Second point is that these detectors always have some hysteresis associated with them. For our example, let's assume a hysteresis of 50 millivolt for the analog supply and 25 millivolt for the digital supply. So each detector will have a lower threshold and upper threshold value. So the problem statement is this. How do you set the upper threshold and lower threshold value for these specifications? Let's consider some possibilities. One rather a naive approach could be to always assert UVLO output if the supply is above the minimum value. And that means to ensure that the highest upper UVLO threshold is always below the Vmin. And following this logic, if we calculate all other thresholds for the analog supply, it will look like this. Obviously, if we take this approach, we can have analog supply as low as 1.53 volt without ever having an UVLO error. And that means analog guys need to ensure their performance for a much lower analog supply. And for this very reason, this is not a good approach. A much better approach is to ensure that UVLO output always triggers if supply is lower than this minimum value. Following this approach, we can again calculate the threshold values. In this case, we start with the minimum of lower threshold value and then work our way up. Notice that in this case, in the worst case scenario, the UVLO will not assert until supply has crossed 1.67 volts. And in most scenario that I have seen so far, it is fine. In most cases, when your chip is starting up, you don't have any large loads on your supplies. So it is a good idea to have some margin when you do have some loads. And this is the approach that I have always taken in my own designs. Now let's look at a hysteretic comparator design. This design has a normal voltage comparator at the core. A supply voltage or its attenuated version is applied at the plus terminal. And the minus terminal which has the reference voltage has two switches. These switches operate in complementary fashion. That means if one is on, the other is off. The circle over here indicates the digital inversion. The switches are controlled by the comparator output itself. When supply is low, the comparator output is low as well. And that selects the VTH as a reference. VTH stands for high threshold and it is higher than VTL. In fact, if supply is directly applied at the comparator input, then the difference of VTH and VTL is the hysteresis voltage. When supply is higher than the VTH, the comparator output goes high and it selects VTL as a reference. And that means supply is now being compared with a lower reference voltage. When supply ramps down and goes below VTL, the comparator output again becomes low and again VTH is selected. And from this diagram, you can see the hysteresis in action. Hysteresis is important for the supply detectors because supply ramp is rarely a monotonous input. Without hysteresis, you will almost always see multiple toggles on detectors output. Amount of hysteresis depends on many factors. For example, how much noise do you expect on your supply? Or if there is a spec of absolute minimum supply where startup must happen. One final remark about this circuit. There is nothing unique about the reference input. You can as well put these switches on the supply input. Just make sure that you get the control right. Sometimes you may need to add some delay in the control. Going by our example, we need four such detectors in our design. Two for analog and two for digital supply. One for UVLO and one for OVD. These are generally always on circuits, so designed with very low currents. Most of the time, these circuits are also placed very close to each other. As a result, there can be interference. The most common situation is that toggling in one detector causes noise in the reference voltages of other detectors. Make sure you account for all the coupling mechanisms. And if necessary, introduce some measures of decoupling. It is always a good idea to have a bypass mechanism in case something goes wrong. And that is all I wanted to discuss in this video. So post your comments below and thanks for watching.